reading from a script so that I keep to 10 minutes. I timed it at home. So I'm fascinated by the relationship between the sonic and the visual in notated music and find that it is in this dynamic that new ways of approaching notation lie. And with that, of course, the way in which we conceive of the musical and what it means to listen in particular. That we consider music notated or otherwise as a sonic art form seems only natural. After all, we encounter it through listening. That musicians, whether performers, composer, theorists or thinkers, should focus their attention on the score seems e equally reasonable, since it is notation that often lies at the heart of their profession. The mythologizing of the score, the belief that the musical work's essence may be found in it, rather than in the act of listening, however, seems a very curious attitude. Though the reason for this lies in the ephemeral nature of music in its fleeting, slippery, temporal existence. If music is notated, then it leaves, after it has sounded, a tantalizing trace of its existence, the score. An illusion of solidity which fulfills a human need to find definite meaning in music and attach t tangible values to it. This sense of the authority of the score remains strong, but it is <coughs> diminishing. However, thinking about music as a purely sonic activity is equally curious when the score plays such a vital role in the realization of musical ideas, at least in notated music. After all, the communication of the sonic ideas from composer to performer is in most cases pure, a purely visual affair. This visual aspect of notation, I believe, represents a pivotal moment in notated music's sonification. But I would go further and suggest that the act of writing notes on paper, of sketching musical ideas, must in some way play an important role in the auditory imaginings of the composer. Much as sketching and drawing influences the visual imagining process of artists. It is in um, an article by Leo Treitler, who has shown that the act of writing instructions in medieval chant onto manuscript for the purpose of sound production in some cases altered the sonic realization of musical material and ultimately influenced the evolution of what he calls Western art music. And it's in that that I find an inkling that this might indeed be the case. Sketching or drawing is an activity that visual and sound practices have in common, particularly in the early stages of the process of conceiving of a piece of work. It is in sketches where we find ideas starting to develop towards and form into something more concrete. When they are beyond the point of thought alone, but not necessarily discipline specific. This means that sketches by a designer, artist, or composer might look remarkably similar and don't necessarily include any indication as to the artist's particular medium. According to Rudolf Arnheim, the sketch in design represents a point of vagueness, one which can be understood as a positive moment of possibility. A step within a creative process that has not yet committed itself to any particular outcome, still open to changes, variations, and digressions. And I think it is this point in the compositional process where new ways of thinking about the sonic, new strategies for notating for new instruments or new sonic environments might most easily be developed before we have committed ourselves to conventional notation, text, or any other graphic system. But are ideas about drawing and sketching in design relevant to the act of writing notation? As I mentioned earlier, the transmission of the sonic idea from composer to performer is mostly a purely visual instance in the form of notated score. This is not that dissimilar to architect, uh, architectural practitions, for example, which, where the design idea is communicated via plan to the builder of the house. Gabriella Goldschmidt's principle of backtalk, in which she understands sketching as an aid to thinking, is one that is interesting in relation to notation. She explains that through freehand sketching in particular, which is fast and direct, and because the artist is highly sensitive during the process, the artist enters into the conversation with the material through the act of sketching. 
For Goldschmidt, sketching presents an extension of mental imagery. In our mind, we can easily and quickly manipulate imagery, which the artist then visualizes and further manipulates through drawing on the sketching surface. A dynamic dialogue between mental imagery and sketched imagery develops. They affect each other. They talk back to one another. Sketching to her, then, is extremely effective in enhancing, manipulating, and restructuring mental images. And furthermore, the act of sketching has a direct relationship to the final design outcome. My question is whether something similar might be happening in the process of compos composing a piece of music. And there are indications this is indeed the case. First, Otto Laske has shown that sonic events can give rise to semantic auditory images, which can be understood as similar to visual mental images. He writes, semantic auditory images, when considered in the context of compositional activity, may be said to cause reasoning processes. And indeed, composers similar to designers in relation to three-dimensional visual imagery imagine the sounds of their work and manipulate these in their minds. Secondly, we can see a connection between notation and writing in the origins of notation itself, which mirrors the development of punctuation in language. Punctuation first appeared in the orator's repertoire to help structure de the delivery of a speech and is also the beginning of pneumatic notation. And although there is a difference in signification, as Tim Ingold so eloquently describes, there is nonetheless a tantalizing connection between reasoning through writing and sounding through notating. He writes, both the writer in the production of a script and the composer in the production of a score are making graphic marks on a paper surface. In both cases, these marks could be regarded as, as representations of sounds. But when we encounter these marks, they take us off in opposite directions. With a script, we recognize the marks as letters and words, imprinted on the surface of the paper, just as they are supposed to be imprinted upon the surface of the mind. And they direct us immediately to what they are supposed to stand for, namely ideas or concepts. Recognizing the marks on the musical score, however, as notes and phrases rather than letters and words, they are taken to stand not for ideas or concepts, but for the sounds themselves. In short, in comparing language and music, we find that the direction of signification is reversed. Reading a script is an instant of cognition, of taking in the meanings described in the text. Reading music is an instance of performance, of acting out the instructions inscribed in the score. The former, if you will, takes us ever inward into the domain of reflective thought, the latter takes us ever outward into the surrounding ambience of sound. Thank you, Claudia. Do we have any questions for Claudia? Thanks, Claudia. It was a rich and beautiful presentation. 
I'm utterly uh, convinced by argument about, argument about sketching and, and, and thought and, and that sort of thing. There's a fundamental difference, it strikes me, between the way architects or uh, figurative um, visual artists work and how sound works. Mm. That is, that you can't scale music, musical form, sonic form down. That is, you can look at, I don't know, one of the early sketches for Guernica or something like that. You can see, you know, if it's on the back of an envelope, you can see the shape of the ultimate painting. Uh, you can't do that with, I don't know what, the Beethoven Symphony or a piece of... Or yeah, you can't do that with a You can have, yeah, but you, can't, you, don't see the, you don't see the sonic detail, if you like, and the form in the same <coughs> language, the same terms. So it's kind of what you're seeing on the paper is is not um, the feeling of what you encounter if you walk mm. into a building, and the same is with with notation. Mm. Is that mm. what you were? Kind of, but if you imagine a large figural painting, I don't know, big Velasquez or something like this, mm. you could reduce it and still see what it is. You could sketch out the shape, and it would still make sense. You see, but of course, there are formal pictures of only music. Not experientially, because you don't have the sense of walking through the room. I mean, I can. No, no, of course, I'm not just you don't lose anything, but. Uh. <coughs> but the thing that I think I'm interested in is that point before it becomes discipline specific. Mm -hmm. So when I look at an architectural drawing and they map out the space of how the building is going to be, and a lot of composers, when you look at their sketches, do exactly that in a mm -hmm. temporal sense. Sure. when what happens and that is very similar and it can look extremely similar mm. and if you don't know you might confuse an architect's sketches with a uh, large scale orchestral piece completely or but what you don't get is uh, in, a, in a picture of the large scale form <coughs> of a piece say is any sense of what the detail is of what the figure is and there you for instance you had notes you had rhythms um, if you scale that up to 30 minutes. I'm just suggesting that there's a difference on that level in, in terms of the mode of notation, that these notational habits don't scale in the same ways. That's all. I'm completely convinced by your argument. I wonder if it has to do with intentionality as well. Um, I mean, I talk to composers a lot, and I think it's interesting where does this difference happen between the architect doing his or her sketch and the composer but I think the intention of the composer being sonic hearing or some kind of musical or sonic outcome um, and surely that must make I mean I, we, d we discussed this a lot about graphic notations can you just musically interpret anything just because it's a graphic and it's, it's a very different sonic outcome if you're interpreting something that was written with the intention of being sound rather than taking a painting or something, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the Velasquez, for example. Yeah. <laughs> I think the similarity I see in particular between, um, the similarity I see between architects or designers and composers in particular as maybe not quite the same as painters, for example, is that we're all dealing with space and we're all putting something into space. You know, whether that is sound or a building or an object that we've designed. So we are in our in the way we think about what we're going to create, we're kind of playing around in space with it. And I think that's where I see the the real similarity between the two. Which yeah, is not the same as, as painting necessarily, maybe. I don't know, I haven't thought about that yet. So I look forward to continue this discussion <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> uh, but now we have Einar Torbjörnsson.